America is a nation powered by change. At its best, it's a restless, future-oriented place. And presidential campaigns have thrown up surprises before. Barack Obama was one of them. But nothing in recent history compares to this. Cowardice. Are you serious? Apologies for freedom. I can't handle this. President Donald Trump knows how to make America great. Deal from strength or get crushed every time. Since he announced last June that he planned to stand, Donald Trump has dominated this year's presidential election season. Ladies and gentlemen, I am officially running for President of the United States, and we are going to make our country great again. I'm Justin Webb, and for eight years I reported for the BBC from North America. I was certainly aware of Donald Trump. He was known around the world as a loud-voiced businessman and a man whose brand had been honed on reality TV. What were his politics? Well, he'd had things to say. He'd even run for the presidency in a half-hearted way, pulling out early and never seeming serious. Now, quite suddenly, he was. I will build a great, great wall on our southern border and I will have Mexico pay for that wall. That's right, a lot of people up there can't get jobs. Because there are no jobs. Because China has our jobs. And Mexico has our jobs. They all have our jobs. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. In Donald Trump, the people's billionaire, I'm finding out what Trumpism is. And I'm doing it in the place where he was born, brought up, and built the foundations of his business empire and his huge wealth, New York City. <laughs> Donald John Trump was born in 1946 in Queens, a comfortably well-off area to the east of the city. He was one of five children born to Fred and Mary Ann Trump. His family was wealthy. He had a good education, topped off at Wharton, one of America's finest business schools. But along with the privilege, unusually perhaps, came a kind of hunger. By definition, someone running for president has to be so self-involved and so self-confident that it verges on unreality. This is something that Donald, I think, acquired growing up. Michael D'Antonio is one of Trump's most recent biographers who portrays a young man obsessed in every sphere of life with success. This fellow Norman Vincent Peale, who was a pastor of a church in Manhattan, wrote this book called The Power of Positive Thinking. It, his ideal was the vacuum cleaner salesman who gets a thousand doors closed in his face but makes a sale on the next one. And he told me he's a great believer in the power of positive thinking. And second to his own books, that's his favorite book. Armed from a young age with the theology of self-belief, Donald Trump has only grown in confidence, as Michael D'Antonio discovered when he started negotiating with the man himself about the way this new biography would be written. He's a classic salesman, so the minute he knows you want something, he couldn't possibly give it to you. But I knew he'd say yes. He can't resist attention. So, so how did the conversation go then at that first meeting? Oh, it'll probably be a terrible book. You, I don't know. You'll probably be horrible to me. And he said, well, I'm not going to sue you. I thought, OK, that's a good thing. I've got that on record that he's not going to sue me because he sues just about everyone. Like any good journalist, though, Michael wanted the full picture, not just the Trump line. He spoke to friends, to former wives and to those who didn't like Trump. And in doing so, Michael learned a lesson about the way the Donald operates, perhaps the way he would operate if he were president. I heard from an attorney of his who sounded like Tony Soprano with a law degree. And I was like, we want to know what's in this book. And I said, I'm not going to tell you what's in the book. Well, we demand a copy of it. And we went back and forth. He was upset about the title. And I said, no, the title of the book is never enough. And I said to him, Michael, has it ever been enough for Donald? And he actually laughed. And he said, 
Well, to tell you the truth, I, I don't have a problem with the title because there never is enough for this guy. There's never enough attention, never enough money, never enough power. He's insatiable. Skyscrapers need strong foundations, and Donald Trump's personal foundations were rock solid. Not just his wealth, but the example set by his father, Fred, who had bought land in the tougher neighbourhood of Brooklyn and made his fortune there. My father was a very tough, strong businessman. He was a great negotiator, and he taught me a lot. I'm in Coney Island, a long, long way, literally and metaphorically, from the center of New York, from Manhattan, from the glamorous bits. It's about an hour outside on the subway, and it's an area where people through the generations have come to live who do the nitty-gritty work in New York, people who are by no means rich. And this is where Fred Trump, Donald Trump's dad, began it all. And I'm in Fred Trump Village, which still very much stands today. Fred Trump had big hopes in the 1960s for the nearly 4,000 seafront apartments he built here. He thought the rich and the famous of New York City would flock to the coast to look out over the North Atlantic. They never came. And Coney Island declined gently. Today, it's a rundown seaside resort. The arcades and amusements are mostly empty. But Trump Village is still very much a part of the landscape and much appreciated, too. He built these buildings. And he Fred, ran them well, didn't Fred he? Fred C. Trump, yeah, yeah. What do you think of Donald? I like him. I really do. Hey, the, the word Trump is synonymous with excellence. His father was great, you know. He was a great realtor, you know. He built these buildings. He built Beach Haven, where I used to live. This was the business, the basic business, that made Fred Trump his money. And it's the place that Donald Trump would have grown up knowing well. But Donald Trump had other ideas. He didn't turn his back on this. He didn't disapprove of it. But he had other ambitions. He had things he wanted to do. So he got on that subway and made that journey to the more difficult part of New York, the more glamorous part of New York, the place where the risks were bigger, the rewards were bigger. That place was Manhattan, the high-rise heart of New York City, the place Fred Trump, for all his success, never managed to crack. But he had laid the groundwork for his ambitious son, the money, the connections. A great deal was handed to him on a plate. The most valuable thing he received from his father was access to the mayor of New York. Michael D'Antonio, Trump's biographer again. When Donald brought in some people who owned the property he wanted to develop, the mayor at the time said, what the Trumps want, the Trumps get in this city. And that sealed it. So that was Donald's first deal. It was the renovation of the old Commodore Hotel, actually built by Commodore Vanderbilt he turned it into what's called the Grand Hyatt. This would not have happened if you were anyone else's son. This is the moment, this arrival into Manhattan, that brings Donald Trump and politics together. Not the politics of ideas, not even the politics of power. He wasn't interested in creating a movement with a view to changing something. Professor Gene Zeno from the University of New York says this was the politics of business. It meant public agreements and disagreements that got the Trump name noticed and respected. I think they have almost always had a business purpose. And so he would famously feud with politicians and public officials. And then in a year or two or three, when it suited his purposes or theirs or jointly, they would be on the mend. And I think that's what you find with Donald Trump. He's very loud. He's aggressive. He fights for what he wants. But in the end, he also looks in a very pragmatic way at the long term picture and he will adjust in the way that he needs to. That was the start. Trump had arrived on the streets of Manhattan. He splashed his money around on cars, luxurious suits, glamorous girlfriends, who got him noticed and admired and became part of his brand. All his three wives have been models. A Trump lifestyle was emerging, a lifestyle that needed a signature building, something to seal the deal. Well, Trump Tower was one of my earlier battles. And at the time, it was very, very controversial because it's a very tall building. It's 68 stories. 
I'm right in the centre of Trump Tower now, next to the escalator where uh, Donald Trump announced his presidency. Remember, he came down to the escalator uh, and announced it to a group of people. But it was one of those Donald Trump moments. I've got to say, it's not really as impressive as you might expect in many ways. It's got a Trump bar and there's a Trump shop and there's a Starbucks. It's a slightly jaded feel to it. It's almost as if Donald Trump has lost interest in this place, which I suppose in many respects he has. When we opened up Trump Tower, it was a, it was a different world. Now it's all just Trump this and Trump that. Barbara Rez was the woman who led the construction of Trump Tower, which opened in 1983. A woman in charge of a building site in a world as chauvinistic as construction, chosen by Donald Trump over other male contenders. What does this tell us about the Donald? Trump is a smart guy, and he has a theory about women, which he shared with me. He said that, in general, men tend to be better than women at what they do, but a good woman is better than ten good men. That's what he said. <laughs> and he took the decision to put you in charge of Trump Tower, which was the big project. Can you remember the conversation that led to you being hired to do that? Yes, I went to his apartment on Fifth Avenue, and I, the one thing that sticks in my mind till, till now is that everything was white. As a matter of fact, before he set up that meeting, we had been together at a, um, a grand opening party for the Hyatt Hotel, and I introduced him to my husband, and he said to my husband, she's going to work for me, I'm going to double her salary. Not only did Barbara Rez lead the project to build Trump Tower, she then helped Trump sell the shopping spaces and the luxury apartments. And working closely with him, she felt that she'd found out what he'd really thought, who he really is. He is the best salesman I have ever seen in my life. He could sell ice to the Eskimos in their coldest winter. Did you sense that Donald Trump had strong political opinions of his own? Absolutely. You... So what were his political views when you knew him? Well, he was a Democrat when we started out. I thought he was fairly liberal, to be honest with you. I know that he supported abortion rights because we talked about these things when they came up. Really? What, what did he say to you about abortion? You know, a woman's right. The government shouldn't intrude. Right. So you always felt when you were with him that he was the kind of person who supported abortion rights. I always right. felt that he supported abortion rights and I always felt that he supported gay rights. Trump Tower turned Donald Trump into hot property in his own right. The signature tower was followed by the signature book, the co-written bestseller, The Art of the Deal. Trump toured the talk show studios and in 1988 on The Oprah Winfrey Show, he made it clear he had strong views and she popped that question. Something's going to happen over the next number of years with this country because you can't keep going on losing $200 billion, and yet we, we let Japan come in and dump everything right into our markets and everything. It's not free trade. This, this sounds like political presidential talk to me, and I know people have talked to you about whether or not you want to run. Would you, would you ever? I just probably wouldn't do it, Oprah. I probably wouldn't, but I do get tired of seeing what's happening with this country, and if it got so bad, I would never want to rule it out totally. The Great Japan Scare is long gone, but modern Americans do fear China, and many, Democrats and Republicans, believe that the Chinese trade unfairly with America. What is new, really new, and shocking to the Republican Party establishment is having a man who is a potential candidate being so outspoken in his economic nationalism. Vin Weber is a former congressman and aide to Mitt Romney, the last Republican nominee. He is politely horrified. Everybody says he's very smart. Most people say that in his personal relationships, he's a friendly person, a likable person, a good friend to have. But your personal life really does not tell you what kind of a public leader you're going to be. If Trump actually becomes president and acts on the promises that he has made, his presidency would mark a dramatic and radical reverse in direction for the United States, the most significant change in trade policy in the post-World War II era. Donald Trump is the first serious candidate to come close to winning the Republican nomination, which he's on the track to win, I'm sorry to say, who wants to basically dismantle the trading order that we've put together since the end of World War II. You're listening to Donald Trump, the people's billionaire, with me, Justin Webb, on the BBC World Service. Trump says he's very, very rich. 
And he is. His personal finances and the tax he pays are not yet public knowledge, but he is for sure a billionaire, a status he has managed to hold on to even though his companies during the 1990s real estate recession really suffered and sometimes failed, leaving him in huge and frightening debt. I was walking down Fifth Avenue and there was a man in front of Tiffany and he was holding a can and I said, do you know that man is wealthier than me? And she looked at me, she said, what are you talking about? I said, that man across the street is worth $900 million more than me. But he managed to refinance his debts, his creditors took the losses, and so was born the idea that Donald Trump was too big to fail. Four businesses that he's been associated with have been wound up, although personally Donald Trump himself has never been declared bankrupt. <laughs> He reached new levels of fame in 2004 when he starred in the reality TV series The Apprentice, the programme's theme tune summing up Donald's first love. Millions each week would tune in to see Trump utter the catchphrase You're fired to the contestants that each series would hope to land a job with his company. When there was a celebrity version of the hit show, the journalist and TV presenter Piers Morgan was the winner. I was in the show for about five weeks and I spent most of that time watching Trump in his natural habitat of his boardroom. And I was very impressed with him. I saw a pretty smart guy who knew how to play that boardroom of very varied human contestants, like a concert conductor. I saw somebody who had a, a warmth, a good humour, a sense of perspective. Trump, to me, is somebody I've known him for a decade. I've spoken to him regularly on the phone. He rang me about a month ago. And we had a long chat about the election. And if people could hear him when he hasn't got you know, the TV cameras in front of him, and he was just one-on-one. -on -one. He's a very different beast. He's a lot calmer. He's a lot more rational. This is a guy, I remember, who's never had an alcoholic drink, never had a cigarette. He doesn't even have coffee. This is a bloke completely in control who knows exactly what he's doing. That's the positive view. Another less positive is provided by Barbara Rez, the builder of Trump Tower, who saw her boss changed by celebrity. Donald and I on Trump Tower used to have knock him down, drag him out fights. I mean, we really, you know, went at each other. But um, Really? Sh oh, yeah. Shouting, both of you? Yes, yes. And, I, I mean, I, I, I loved it. I loved that job, and I loved the relationship I had with him, even though he was very tough to work for, and it could be very hard on you. And your relationship with him since then? My relationship changed over time. The next time I went back was long after he had built Trump Tower, and he had the casinos, and he was a celebrity. You know, it was very different. How? He was a different person. He was more into his head and less interested in listening to people argue with him. And then came the election of Barack Obama, the first black president, an intellectual, a thinker, not a deal maker, a man who'd never been in business, a man who seemed more interested in spreading wealth than making it. Trump was polite about him at first, but for reasons never fully explained, he changed direction very, very sharply, allying himself in an ABC TV interview with those conspiracy theorists who had taken to questioning whether Obama had been born in the USA. Three weeks ago when I started, I thought he was probably born in this country. And now I really have a much bigger doubt than I did before. But based on what? And, and you know what? His grandmother in Kenya said he was born in Kenya and she was there and witnessed the birth. Okay. He doesn't have a birth certificate or he hasn't shown it. He has what's called a certificate of live birth. That is something that's easy to get. Suddenly, Donald Trump was very much back in the game and fair game for the president himself at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, where the great and the good come to hear humorous speeches. The president was funny, but Somebody wounding too. And I know just the guy to do it. Donald Trump <laughs> is here tonight. Now, I know that he's taken some flack lately, but no one is happier, no one is prouder to put this birth certificate matter to rest than the Donald. And that's because he can finally get back to focusing on the issues that matter. Like, did we fake the moon landing? What really happened in Roswell? And where are Biggie and Tupac? 
he comes in for a lot of negative attention. And I suspect that at that moment, he vowed to himself that he was going to be the one to take the keys to the Oval Office from Obama in 2017. Michael D'Antonio, the biographer, sees that dinner as pivotal, as he heard the president's supporters roared with laughter and thought they'd seen Trump off. But what few people quite gauged was the extent to which Mr Trump would be able to ally his personal annoyance with the mood of the Republican Party grassroots, his anger and his willingness to shout out, to be impolitic, unpolitically correct, factually wrong, but politically on the money. Some Republicans liked very much what they saw. We were trying to persuade him in 2013 to run in 2014 for governor of New York. And he was the target. Why? He could afford $50 million campaign and he had absolute name recognition. He didn't have to buy a name recognition. Carl Palladino is a former Republican candidate himself for the governorship of New York State. He connected with me right from the outset. And trust me, he gives no people no reason not to trust him. And in the end of the day, he says, I'm going to consider this as, as, as a first step in my effort to become president of the United States. If it had just been Trump versus Obama, it would be a footnote in history at best, but it isn't. Trumpism is about more than personal pique or the vanity of a rich man. It is so much more significant than that. We can't ship 11 million people out of this country. Children would be terrified okay, okay, and it will okay. not work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Trump, truth. you've had a good... Can I let me just... Let's built an unbelievable company worth billions and billions of dollars. I don't have to hear from this man, Mr. believe me. I don't have to hear from him. Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump, you yourself, you yourself <laughs> said let uh, Governor Bush speak. Governor Bush. Thank you, Donald, for Jerry Baker is the editor of the Wall Street Journal, who became an overnight American political celebrity when he tried to question Mr. Trump and the other Republican candidates during a Fox Business Network debate. Jerry Baker, urbane and English, is not a natural Trump man, but he understands why others are. Donald Trump is a fascinating phenomenon. I think in this country, many people feel that they have been let down by and ignored by their leadership. In America... In the last 20 years, middle class, as they call them here, sort of people on median incomes, they've seen no increase in their median incomes in the last 20 years. At the same time, they've seen people on Wall Street become phenomenally rich. They look at Silicon Valley and they see the amazing successes of the US economy and they see the benefits of those successes going to a very small, very rich elite. And they're angry and frustrated about that. At the same time, they see a political elite which doesn't seem to care about them either. And they feel angry and Donald Trump is really, really good at channeling and articulating that anger. And what an anger it is. The anger of a group of Americans with their backs against the wall. The state counties where Trump's support is highest right across America are the same counties in almost every case in which death rates among white men under 64 are highest. It is the scream of a dying people, a dying class, a class well understood by Trump supporters like Carl Palladino. You understand what Rebuild America is about? That thing rings when you're talking about the little guy out there. You're a carpenter, okay? You go to work every day, you sweat, and you know damn well that you work a good part of your day so that this other guy who's sitting at home drinking his beer, watching television, all right, you're paying for him. We're not letting immigrants in who have earned their immigration. We're letting everybody in. When I was a kid, my father could tell me Okay, you Carl, if you do this, this, and this, you're going to have a successful life. Can we do that now? That's the loss of hope. That's the loss of confidence in the future. This government is so far afield. I'm talking about Republicans and Democrats. Okay, the Republican leadership stinks in this country. They're all perched asses. But here's a further twist in our effort to get to the bottom of Donald Trump's politics. He is, as a New Yorker might say, a billionaire for crying out loud. He's a plutocrat. He's a one percenter. He is no carpenter. He has gold taps and a private jet. Is he serious when he says this? We won with young. We won with old. We won with highly educated. We won with poorly educated. I love the poorly educated. 
It's where the old meets the new in American politics and perhaps soon in other Western democracies. The old is the Trump base. These people are not the future of the United States. They are literally dying out. But the idea that they can be represented by a single individual without the baggage of policies and programmes, in fact, without any real ideology, that seems to me to be quite modern. It is identity politics. Mr Trump does not pretend to be poor, far from it, but he does suggest that he understands and can represent the fearful, the dispossessed. His New York supporter, Carl Palladino, waved away my efforts to get him to list detailed policies. It is, in the post-ideological age of celebrity, all about the Donald and his connection with his people. Those basic qualities, trust, strength, making executive decisions, has actually signed the front of a paycheck. But he doesn't know what it's like to be poor. No, he, maybe he doesn't know. I, I was poor. Okay, I came up the hard way, everything I have, and I'm a multi, multi-millionaire, okay? He's taking that leadership role of, the peop of a movement of people that are fed up with the way things have been. Donald Trump's madcap rise to the top of American politics has been the political surprise of the century. But this man knows how to sell, which buttons to press. He's nobody's fool, and he's tapped into a real hunger for change. Trumpism is propelled by skill, good luck, and bravado, he admits as much himself. To be successful in business, you have to put up a good front. Life is, is not all sincerity. Life is an act to a large extent. The old song tells the swaggering inhabitants of New York City that if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. America, the world, is about to find out if that's true in the case of Donald J. Trump, the people's billionaire.